Hello, welcome to my apartment. Um, today we're going to talk about World War I. Uh, this is specifically for my Springfield High School dual credit class. Um, probably also part of this will be for my Greenbrier class since we've lost so many days to different things. Uh, this will probably be in at least two parts. What we really want to talk about today is not just the American perspective on World War One, but kind of how it got started and kind of look at it a little bit internationally. Um, please make sure that you uh, read uh, the chapter on World War One, and if you actually have any uh, questions, uh, email me, text me, leave a comment in the comments section, um, or ask me when we get back to class after spring break. Um, so. World War I is kind of interesting because it's a war that didn't have to happen. And where it really begins is it really begins in the late 1800s in an era of Europe known as the Balkans. Uh, what had happened is the Ottoman Empire uh, had controlled much of the Balkans up until the late, 20th, uh, late 19th century. And they began to kind of wane. And as places like Greece and Serbia and other places in the area began to gain their independence, uh, other European nations kind of saw it as an opportunity to expand their own domains. Uh, this will lead to conflict between Austria and Russia, for instance. Um, and it's actually in the Balkans where the war will start. Now, there had actually been some crises in the Balkans uh, prior to World War I. Uh, Austria was very much interested in uh, creating an even larger empire by taking uh, Serbia and other places down there. Uh, Russia felt a kinship with the people of the Balkans. Uh, the Serbians were also Slavic people. Uh, so Russia felt kind of protective, plus they wanted to expand their own sphere of influence. Um, the most powerful country down there is uh, Serbia. Serbia also has ambitions of creating a larger Serbian Slavic state. Uh, if they happened to do that, that would have actually um, impacted Austria. So the Austrian-Hungarian Empire was just this huge conglomeration of different ethnic groups and Austria was very much concerned that if Serbia gained, became more and more powerful uh, the, the Slavic portions of the Austrian Empire would uh, try to leave and join Serbia so Austria is very interested in subduing Serbia and taking over uh, the Middle East or not the Middle East the Balkans um, so what happens is for a long time there's peace mainly because of uh, a German chancellor uh, named Otto von Bismarck, the first chancellor. Uh, he's actually responsible for creating a unified Germany. Uh, he actually stopped a lot of war from happening uh, by being in an alliance with both Austria and Russia. Uh, that way he could kind of keep them from uh, fighting each other. Um, now, unfortunately, probably for the world, um, in Germany, um, the, old, the, R, the old Kaiser dies, and he's replaced by William II, who has his own ideas about what Germany should de be, and one of the first things that he does is he actually fires Otto von Bismarck, and he drops his treaty with Russia. Um, now, Russia had formally dropped out of the uh, alliance a few years ago, but had Otto von Bismarck had smartly signed a reinsurance treaty with Russia just to make sure uh, Russia never fought Germany. Now, the fear was that if Germany and Russia were not somehow allied, that Russia and France would be allied. Uh, what William II believed was that France was a Republican state Russia had a czar and a king and that there would actually be no way uh, that the two of them would ever form an alliance. Well, Germany drops the alliance with Russia. Russia almost immediately signs an alliance with France. Um, and so you got already 
two camps in Europe. You have France and Russia allied, you have Germany and Austria allied, and eventually Italy will join in with Germany and Austria. Um, now, Germany at this time, William II, what he wants to find is Germany's place in the sun. Uh, and he's also trying to colonize different places of the world. Uh, this is very annoying to the British, who have probably the largest colonial empire still at this point. And it actually does something that had not been really done in history before. It actually brought the British and the French closer together. And the British will actually join uh, what's called the Triple Entente, which will be a loose alliance with both Russia and France to kind of blunt German ambitions. Uh, so the problem here is you have two camps in Europe, you have two alliances, you have all kinds of things going on in Serbia, in the Balkans, Austria is trying to be aggressive. Uh, this is all at the expense of the Ottoman Empire. There's a few wars that are kind of fought down there um, by various people. I'm not going to go into that, but it's very interesting if uh, you might want to take a Western Civ class or something like that or read on it about it on your own. Um, and what it does is it really leads to bad blood uh, between uh, the two alliances, especially Russia and Austria. Uh, what's really going to leave a really bad taste is um, Russia will actually back down in the early 1900s in a confrontation with Austria uh, because Germany told them to, um, which meant that Russia had embarrassed itself. Uh, Russia leading up to World War One found itself in a position where it really felt that it had to respond in kind next time they were threatened. Now, a lot of people actually agreed that if war came to Europe again, it would probably be because of the crisis between Serbia and Austria. Uh, the real key was that if when war came between Serbia and Austria, whether or not uh, the war could be contained between those two nations. Uh, basically, what you have is you have Europe, they have two alliances, you have France, Ger you have France, Russia, and Great Britain on one side, you have Germany, Austria, and then later Italy and what's called the Triple Alliance on the other side. Uh, these are ironclad treaties that say if you're attacked we have your back we'll go to war for you um so basically early night early 1900s what we're waiting for in europe is just that spark to kind of start the war um other problem was militarism this is a time where european nations had really kind of built up their own arsenals and they had large standing armies and the problem is when you have large standing armies you feel the need to actually use them um, and this is kind of a problem um, now what's going to precipitate this is June 28 1914 uh, Austria decides that they want to prove to the people of the Balkans that they are the big dog, they are the ones in charge, uh, they are controlling a place called Bosnia, and they decide they want to kind of show the flag. So they want to send someone who's in the royal line uh, to kind of show them that they're the ones in charge. So they send a guy named Archduke Franz Ferdinand, you might see it as Francis Ferdinand, um, and here's what happened. Now. Franz Ferdinand was not particularly a popular guy in Austria. Uh, that's why he's probably chosen for this. Now what happened is they send him down there. They think, well, you know, gets him out of the way. He's kind of a, he's, he's not going to really ever become king. He's kind of far down the line. Um, so they send him down there. They're kind of hoping almost for an incident so that they can finally go to war with Serbia. You know. A different country um, and what happens is that Franz Ferdinand is down there and there's an organization a Serbian national organization is called the Black Hand 
and they are going to try to assassinate uh, the Archduke. Now, this is kind of one of those odd stories in history. Um, the assassin actually tried to take one shot at the Archduke, his gun jammed. Uh, he's walking home, he thinks he's lost his opportunity. Uh, Franz Ferdinand is in a carriage, his driver doesn't know where he's doing, he gets stuck in an alley, they're backing up. Uh, the assassin gets another shot and actually this time kills uh, Archduke Ferdinand. Now Austria is incensed. They are angry. They blame Serbia for this even though this black hand probably had nothing to do with the Serbian government. Um, now Austria really wants to go to war but they're the ones who want to make sure they look justified in this fight. Uh, so first thing they do is they go to their ally Germany and they say okay we really want to fight here. And Germany issues what history calls the blank check basically saying you do what you want to do we have your back. Now what happens is Austria still kind of wants to look like they're the good guys here. So before they go to war is they issue what's called the Serbian ultimatum which was basically a list of demands designed to infuriate Serbia that would cause them to uh, refuse and then Austria could say hey guys we tried we wanted a peaceful resolution but you know they said no now much to Austria's surprise um, Serbia agreed to everything but one of the ultimatums and that was they weren't going to give up sovereignty uh, to Austrians during the um, investigation. They did agree to a joint investigation. Um, so Austria is kind of in a pickle. They have agreed to a whole lot more than frankly uh, they had expected, right? So they kind of have to think about it. Well, they still want to go to war. Germany has um, already said that they have Austria's back. Uh, only people that Serbia can really count on is Russia. And Russia has its own problems. They had been defeated a few years earlier by the Japanese. Um, so what's going to happen here is Austria is going to say that's not enough. Austria declares war on Serbia on June 28th. And the reason they feel so confident in doing this is because of the blank check given by Germany. And the question we have to ask is why does Germany offer this blank check? Why is William II so interested in a fight here? Um, and there's a lot of things to do and you can look at the archives and Germany really pushes for war at this time. What I think it is, is Germany's a bit of a landlocked country. Germany has a great deal of industry. Uh, Germany is a very powerful country. Uh, but Germany kind of has to strike at a time of its own choosing. And I think William II felt that if there was going to be a great time for Germany to conquer Europe, uh, to do really well in war, this was it. So he's kind of gung-ho. So Austria declares war on Serbia July 28th, 1914. Now, at first, other European nations did try to keep the conflict localized to the Balkans, but it didn't work. Uh, this falls apart almost immediately when Ju on July 28th, Tsar Nicholas II of Russia uh, mobilized his army against Austria. Now, originally, uh, Russia had two war plans. Uh, one was a mobilization against just Austria. Another was a full mobilization against both Austria and Germany. He calls for the mobilization on Austria. The next day he calls for full mobilization. Uh, Germany demanded that Russia stop its mobilization within 12 hours or Germany would go to war. Russia ignores this and Germany declares war on Russia on August 1st. Now, Germany then prepared to use what was called the von Sleifen Plan, and it's created by a general named Alfred von Sleifen, V-O-N-S-C-H-L-I-E-F-E-N. -E -E um, von Sleifen basically spent basically the last years of his life working on this plan. He fine-tunes it between 1891 and 1905. 
And for Germany, this is based on a two-front war with France and Russia. The idea would be that they would send a minimal force to the east to fight Russia, just kind of enough to stall them, and the majority of the army would strike France quickly by going through neutral Belgium. The idea was after they quickly defeated France, the army would then turn its attention to Russia, using their superior network of railroads. Uh, so Germany declared war on France August 3rd. They then demanded that Belgium allow their army to go through their country. Belgium said, we'd rather you not do that. Uh, we got an alliance with Great Britain and they said, we don't have to let you do that. Um, Great Britain, in fact, warned Germany that if they would go to war to protect Belgian neutrality, Germany thought, there's no way you're going to go to war for little Belgium. Uh, they were wrong. Britain declared war on Germany on August 4th. So now you have the major powers of Europe, except for Italy, uh, in this war. Now, a lot of people really thought at this point that war is something that really wouldn't happen because technolo technology had improved so much that frankly war would be so destructive that no rational leader would ever use it. They were so very wrong. Now, the first year of the war, 1914 to 1915, is often known as the stalemate years. And what's interesting is every nation in Europe who were participating in the war were excited. They thought this was a chance to show national pride. Nationalism was an extremely strong force in these nations. Now, what people thought is that, like most wars since 1815 in Europe, this war would last a few weeks, a couple of months at most. Uh, everyone would grab kind of something they wanted and then they would negotiate some sort of treaty. Um, they were wrong. They weren't looking at the right war. If they wanted to kind of get a view of what World War I would have been like, what they really should have done is they should have looked at uh, war, uh, the American Civil War. Uh, it was a real total war and that's pretty much what World War I was going to be. Uh, but everyone's excited. War was seen as an adventure by most of the participants. Now, Germany's success in war would be dependent on a quick defeat of France so they could turn around to Russia. The problem was they thought they could go quickly through Belgium, sweep through northern France, and then sweep around uh, Paris and defeat the French army. Um, the problem was that the von Schlieffen plan was overly complicated. It had to be done precisely right. Um, the Germans decided to change it. They decided to send more troops to the east, uh, which the commander in the east did not want. Um, and it really kind of messed up the plan. The plan also has some timetables involved that you kind of had to be at a certain point at a certain time. And in fact, they actually got within 30 miles of France before the British and the French finally mobilized against them. That was called the First Battle of the Marne, September 6th to the 10th. Um, the Germans decide to fall back. The French and British do not pursue. Uh, the Germans began digging trenches. The French and the British did the same. Basically, in the Western Front, you will have two lines of trenches that will go from the English Channel to Switzerland. If you were in a balloon overhead, you would just see these two opposing trenches and they will be virtually unchanged for the next four years. Now in the East, the warfare is a whole lot more mobile. Uh, Russian forces moved into Eastern Germany. The Germans destroyed them. Uh, this proved the excellent leadership of Paul von Hindenburg and Erich Ludorf, Ludendorff. Uh, the Austrians also, the Austrians are not as good as their Germans. They'll actually be defeated by the Germans in some battles. Uh, Austria will actually be thrown out of Serbia early in the war. Italy will break their alliance and they will join Great Britain, France, and Russia. And they will attack Austria in May of 1915. The reason for this is there was a secret treaty. Uh, the Allies agreed to give Italy a portion of Austria, which would make Italy whole. Um, now... 
honestly, the Italians, not very good fighters. They're not particularly helpful. Um, but they do catch the Austrians by surprise, and finally Germany has to come to their aid. Uh, Germans then rout a Russian army and push them back 300 miles into their own territory, killing, capturing, or wounding 2.5 million Russians in the process. Russia, by this point, is severely weakened. On September 15th, Germany, Austria, and Bulgaria eliminate Serbia from the war. So really, at that point, that's where the war should have ended, right? When, Aust when Serbia is defeated, that was the first thing, but the war continued. Um... Now, because the Germans are so successful in the east, uh, they're allowed to move troops to the west. And what's developed in the west is a very elaborate system of defense. You got the trenches. Uh, the trenches are barbed wire, three to five feet uh, high, 30 feet wide. Behind the trench, you have a 30 foot, uh, you, excuse me, you have a concrete base for machine guns. You put your heavy artillery further back, and basically you're living in a hole. The area in between the trenches was called no man's land. Basically, if you were in no man's land, you were in range of the um, uh, artillery and the machine guns, and you're going to be mowed down. Um, the trench warfare basically made it impossible to be mobile. Uh, most offenses will be a failure, with a few exceptions. Uh, occasionally, either side would actually uh, attempt what they called a breakout, which would be to attack the opposing trench and try to take it over. It hardly ever worked. Uh, millions will actually be killed trying to do this. Um, in fact, at Verdun, 700,000 people will be killed over a few square miles. Uh, Verdun is actually where the French army is broken. Um, Trench life was not very fun. You had poison gas that was introduced in 1915. Uh, you had to deal with the smell of de decomposing soldiers. Uh, what happened is eventually you're going to rotate through the trench system. One week at the front line in combat, one week in the reserve trench, and then two weeks behind the line. Uh, basically, hopefully there's a town back there you can have some fun. Eventually, they set up what's basically a let live and let live system because the soldiers in the trenches were really the first ones to kind of figure out that this wasn't working. Uh, now, the war is going to become a worldwide conflict because other people are going to get involved. The Ottoman Empire joins Germany in 1914. This leads to uh, the British trying to open a front in the Balkans and failing miserably near Constantinople. Um, there will be fighting in the Middle East because that's where the Ottoman Empire is. That's where Lawrence of Arabia comes from. Um, African soldiers will be used in Africa. Fighting will take place there. And most importantly for our services, eventually, for our purposes, eventually the United States will enter the war. Now what we're going to switch to now is a discussion of what's going on from the American perspective.